everybody. How's everybody doing? I can tell you're doing good because everybody's very chatty. So either, either we all missed last week and we're doing all of our catching up from a week where we didn't have church and uh, getting our, our chatties out of the way. Good to see everybody again uh, or, or not. Seems like we are glad to be here. I know I am glad to be here. I'm very excited. Uh, many of you maybe just missed the, the video uh, as you were chatting. I, I'm just going to say, did anybody get to watch the live stream last week well, when we didn't have service? Okay, some of you watched. I don't know if you noticed... Uh, but when the, the sermon bumper video played at Sugar Grove last week, the church started applauding for the sermon bumper. And I was like, that has to go down in history because I don't think that's ever happened before. Before Pastor Tim ever said a word, people were like, let's go for Danny. So I'm just saying that because it's a pretty cool video. And I've been asked in the past, you know how in baseball, guys will have their walk-up song? Well, someone asked me at some point in the past, like, if you had a walk-up song to preach every week, what would it be? And I didn't know how to answer the question. I think I know how to answer it now because that sermon bumper fires me up. And I'm really excited to dive into Daniel uh, with you this morning. So last week was unique for us because we both launched our series in Daniel and we didn't have church here at Indian Creek. So uh, hopefully you, those of you who got to tune into the live stream, that's great. You got to kind of uh, tag along with our Sugar Grove campus as we uh, dove into this. Uh, if not, I did send a message out this week that you were able to hopefully listen to uh, in your email. If you didn't get that email, it means we don't have an email from you. So I'm just going to use this opportunity if you would like to be in the know on some things around here and get some emails as we're trying to communicate with everyone and you didn't get that, fill out uh, the uh, registration card in your bulletin and put your email on there and you can just drop it in the in the box in the back on your way out this morning we will make sure that you are in the know uh, moving forward but we have kicked off uh, our series in Daniel last week we would have here talked about Daniel 1 uh, we are going to be moving along so we are going to be talking about chapter 2 today uh, now I have said probably here before if not I'll say it now that when we study books like Daniel, especially books that are telling stories, it's helpful for us to probably view them less, less like we're reading one of Paul's letters in the New Testament saying, okay, what is God necessarily teaching me to do right here and right now? And maybe approach a study like this a little bit more like we're watching a TV series. Uh, what I mean by that is that each week, if you're watching a TV series, you're going to watch an episode, and that episode is going to tell you some of the story, and then you're going to go and watch the next episode, and the next episode, and as you watch these stories, un or these episodes, the story unfolds as you go. You're going to see certain themes, and certain characters do different things, much like we're going to see here in the book of Daniel. So last week, if we were to kind of view Daniel that way, Daniel 1 is the season opener uh, where we have been introduced to the setting of the book. We've been introduced to the characters of the book, and we've also been introduced to the main plot of the book. For those of you who maybe are still catching up with where we're at, Daniel opened up uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians coming to Judah and besieging Jerusalem. And they, they overtook God's people and we're told in verse 2 of chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar took some of the articles of worship from God's house in Jerusalem and he took them back to Babylon and put them in the temple of his God there. Then Nebuchadnezzar began this kind of uh, assimilation process, if you will, for making the uh, Israelites become Babylonians. Part of this process involved sending his chief eunuch to Jerusalem, and he had a little bit of a scouting mission. He was sent to seek out the cream of the crop of the men in Judah, men of nobility, men with, who were intelligent, men who uh, would have been influencers of the day, and bring them back to Babylon where they would go through a, uh, we'll call it an indoctrination process, a, a change of identity from Jews to Babylonians. In this process, these young men, teenagers more than likely, uh, for our high school students that would have been kind of in your stage of life, these young men were exposed to different cuisine, 
the best that Babylon had to offer. They were exposed to different teaching, different language, uh, an entirely different culture. Uh, They had their names changed. Everything about their life was shaken up so that it might settle in a place where they no longer identified as Jews, as God's people, but now identified as Babylonians. We are told that Daniel and some of his friends, uh, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, these these four guys were part of this group of people who were taken, uh, and they find themselves in Babylon. And last week's episode left off with somewhat of a strange cliffhanger. Because we're thrown into the episode with a lot of problem going on. It would seem like the plot of the book of Daniel is that God's people had been defeated and they'd been taken to Babylon and we are going to watch as the theme centers around the main characters of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But that wouldn't be true. Because the real Theme, the real plot in the whole book of Daniel is found in right there in verse 2. It is a question of who is God in Babylon. That's what this book seeks to answer. Because we are thrown into a place in human history, in the history of God's people, where at the at appearances, on the surface, it at minimum looks like God has been defeated. That's the best case scenario as it would seem. At worst, God's dead and he's completely out of the picture. If you belonged, if you lived in Jerusalem, you belonged to God's people, this could be a time in history where you start scratching your head saying, what is going on? When it seems like God's out of the fight, chapter 1, episode 1, ends with maybe a small glimpse of hope. Maybe God's not out of the fight just yet. He positions these young men. He gives them great gifts. Uh, He gives unique gifts to Daniel, understanding in all visions and dreams. You might wonder if you're watching the season opener as it concludes, you're like, what a strange way to finish the episode. I wonder what's going to happen. Well, episode two uh, picks up right where we left off at the end of chapter 1. Daniel and the boys have now graduated from the University of Babylon, and they've been placed in the king's service alongside his other advisors, his enchanters, diviners, philosophers, all these uh, intelligent people, the smartest of the smart in Babylon serving the king. Daniel and his buddies are a part of that number. And their role, strictly this, serve the king. And their number gets called here in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we are told very early on that King Nebuchadnezzar has some dreams. Now, these aren't just any dreams. These are troubling dreams, the kind of dreams that uh, keep you up at night, the kind of dreams that maybe, maybe they feel so real, you start wondering, were they real? You, you, Was it a dream? And you you just can't seem to shake it. And and Nebuchadnezzar is troubled. He must know the meaning of these dreams. And so he summons, he commands that all of these advisors, the smartest of the best in Babylon, come and they are tasked with one thing. They must tell him what these dreams meant. He must know. But to be sure that their interpretation of these dreams is true, Nebuchadnezzar raises the stakes just a little bit. Not only are you, O wise men of Babylon, to tell me what these dreams mean, but so that I know that you're accurate, you must tell me what the dream was. Now imagine giving that job. That's impossible! Surely we could tell you what the dreams mean, but first tell us what the dream was. No, that's not how this game's going to work, guys. And they push and they push, and, and Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm done playing games. Tell me the dream and its meaning, or I will have you ripped limb from limb and your house is destroyed. Talk about a true do-or-die moment. I imagine, putting myself in the story, being one of those guys... That's a tall task. I might be a little bit nervous, a little frantic to figure out what is happening. So eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar sends out his decree. He's done playing games with these guys, and the decree goes out that they are all to be killed. 
And so this man, Arioch, the chief of the captain's guard, uh, comes and he finds Daniel and his friends. He's come to do what he's been tasked to do. It's the end of the road for these guys. Now Daniel, uh, wondering why the king's decree is so urgent, uh, questions it, and Arioch kind of brings him up to speed. And, and Daniel says, now time out for a second. And he goes and he schedules an appointment with the king. An appointment with the king to tell him the dream and its meaning. That's a pretty bold step at this particular point in time. And Daniel goes back and he finds his buddies. Uh, the other three guys were in verses 17 and following here in Daniel chapter 2. And he tells them, guys, we need, to, we need to go and seek God and pray that he would show mercy on us so that we wouldn't find the fate of the rest of the wise men and be destroyed. Well, God reveals the dream to Daniel and he takes it to King Nebuchadnezzar and he tells him the dream and its meaning and we go through this whole thing and we'll talk about that in a bit. And the story ends, episode two ends with King Nebuchadnezzar paying homage to Daniel and even recognizing his God uh, down in verse 46 and 47. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And as a result, Daniel and his buddies are promoted to uh, greater levels of influence and authority in the kingdom. It's quite the episode. Uh, I, I had tried to imagine at times what would that look like on the screen if, if someone made a, a, an actual TV show that accounted through these different chapters. What might it be like to live through some of this? But to ensure that we deal with this episode properly to make sense of it we need to trace the themes of Daniel through and through there are three verses in this chapter that are critical in helping us do just that read through the chaos read through uh, the the questions and the uncertainties of what's going to happen three verses verse 11 verses 27 and 28 and verse 47 Verse 11 says, the thing, this is the uh, wise men responding to the king. The thing that the king asks is difficult, they say, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. In other words, what they're saying is, there's no way we can do this. Nobody can do what you are asking of us, and the only ones who could would be the gods but they don't even dwell among us, so they won't. So even if they could, they won't. This is an impossible request. You fast forward to verses 27 and 28. Daniel, standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, answers the king when he's asked, do you have the interpretation? And Daniel says, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery the king has asked. In other words, hey, king... I don't in myself. There's not one man, none of the smartest people in Babylon could tell you what you want to know. Verse 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King, to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Fast forward, verse 47, Truly your God is God of gods. Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. These verses help us understand what's happening here in Daniel chapter 2. It, it helps us, uh, much like we face circumstances and situations in our lives that, that we get caught up in the, uh, maybe, maybe the weight of the moments, the, the feelings that go in the moments, and we start wondering, what's God really doing? Well, these verses help us see that through this story, because the story's not just about Daniel. It's not just about King Nebuchadnezzar. The story ultimately is about God. We see in this episode, God goes from maybe still being in the fight to being the God of gods. To, as Daniel and his companions at the end of episode one, stood out tenfold over all the other wise men who'd gone through uh, the University of Babylon. Head and shoulders, they stood out, cream of the crop, the best of the best, here, God stands out above the pantheon of the Babylonian gods. He truly is God of gods. And how will we deal with some of these things? 
So as I was wrestling through this passage, I found myself wondering, how, how, do, you, how do you engage a story like this and preach it in, in, in a way that, that's, that's applicational, true to, true to the story, but doesn't lose sight of the bigger picture, doesn't lose sight of that, that, that God perspective within it. And, and the one thing I kept coming back to is everything about this story was God-sized. Everything is, and that might sound cheesy and cliche, but everything's God's size. Just like uh, in the past, maybe you'd go to Burger King and you'd order fries, and they said, you want to king-size that or supersize that or whatever. Everything here is just heightened a little bit. Everything is God's size. From the very beginning, we are introduced in this story to some God-sized problems. There are God-sized problems. The king's dream, we have the king's demand, and we have the king's decree. All of these present these, these God-sized problems uh, that face the characters that are going on here. None of these things can or are solved by human intellect, human strength, human wisdom, or human reasoning. These are God-sized problems. The king's dream presented a problem to him, uh, stirring him to the core of who he was. We're told in verse 1 of chapter 2 that this dream caused him to lose sleep. I don't know if you've been there, you've done that, you've had a dream like that where uh, it just shakes you a little bit and you can't fall back to sleep. Uh, it's Nebuchadnezzar's story. We're also told in verse 12 that on account of all of this, the king lost its, his cool. Verse 12 says, uh, because of this, the king was angry and very furious. This shook him up quite considerably. The king's demand then became a problem for his advisors. It's an impossible ask, one uh, that no man can achieve. And in their day and age, maybe the, the beginning formations of what we would today call secular humanism, that the, the achievements of, of societies lie in the abilities and the wisdom and the prowess of men, they can't do it. They're helpless in their circumstance. They just don't have an answer. And the, the decree from the king likewise, do it or die. And we see as we, as we look at this, how, how do these different characters respond to these God-sized problems? That's where rubber begins to meet the road. Nebuchadnezzar turned to his own power. He pooled all of his resources. He gathered the smartest people into the room. He commanded them to come. He, by his own decree, the word of his mouth, you're going to come and you're going to do this. And then he leveraged his authority by threatening these individuals. The king has some great resources. How can he use those resources to solve his problems? The wise men, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, didn't turn to their own power. They turned to, we'll call it a place of panic. Recognizing that they didn't have anything uh, to do, it appears they began bargaining and pleading for other alternatives. A couple of times in this story, we see them bargain with King Nebuchadnezzar. Please just tell us the dream. Tell us the dream. Tell us the dream. But Nebuchadnezzar, we're told, reads right through, and he's like, I know you guys are just itching for some time because you don't have anything to go with here. And they start, they start pleading and panicking about the situation because they know that as long as the king's word stays firm, it is their certain ruin. They're done. They're toast. The severity of the situation rises in their final interaction with the king. There is not a man on earth who can do it. Maybe the gods, maybe not panic. And then Daniel and his companions respond, at least it seems, with some level of composure. Uh, we're told that when Arioch comes to them, Daniel responds with prudence, verse 14, and discretion. Now, prudence and discretion would be uh, f like caution and wisdom. And he goes back, he makes uh, the amazing thing to me, verse 16, is that he goes and requests uh, an appointment with the king. He doesn't have an answer at this point. Now some may say, well, what's, what has he got to lose? At least bide some time. Or maybe it's a great act of faith and confidence in the Lord. 
few weeks ago, uh, Bill was preaching New Year's Eve, for those of you who were here. He spoke on uh, prayer and how do we pray, looking at uh, Jesus' teaching with his disciples and, and how we do this. And, and one of the most profound applications that I walked away from listening to that message is it's not just about the persistence of prayer, but it's about the confidence in who you're going to, knowing God. It's who he is. So it would be probably irresponsible of me at even this point to say, hey, look at these guys, they turn to prayer and just say, we, sh- we too should pray. But even in, if that's our application, it's not because prayer is just some magic answer. It's because there's a God on the other end of prayer who is great. There's a God at the other end of prayer who, who sizes up to God-sized problems. And so while the cliche may be from time to time when we face difficult circumstances in life, Maybe the advice we'd give to others, just, just pray about it. Or I'm praying for you. Maybe it's cliche because we know that there's a God on the other end. A God that we have confidence. A God who can provide in the midst of these God-sized problems. When you're faced with God-sized problems, where will you turn? Do you turn to your own panic? Do you turn to your own power and gather your own resources and your own strength and your own wits? Do you start bargaining? Or do you go to the only God who is God in the midst of it? Trusting in his provision. Leads us to the second thing is we're going to kind of dive through this. God-sized problems demand God-sized provisions. They just simply can't be met with man-sized solutions. They need God-sized provisions. And that's exactly what God does in this passage. There's nothing that the guys could do to conceive of determining the king's dream. Conflict. Every good story has conflict. What are you going to do when the heat gets turned up? How's the story going to be resolved? What are the characters going to do? nothing because they couldn't do anything but God does notice a couple of things about God's provision in this particular episode his provision came at just the right moment God's provision was timely and not too soon and not too late and before before you start thinking that I'm just talking about saving their tales Notice the bigger picture. God's timing was not so soon. He didn't show up on the scene early in this episode. Sometimes fever pitch is part of God's design because it's in the fever pitch moments of life that we begin to see God as God. It wasn't until all resources had been expended on the part of the Babylonians, until the smartest people in the kingdom came and said, we cannot do this. The gods won't do this. When there's no other solution, no other place to turn, God steps up. And God does what only God could do in that scenario. What no man had the power to do, what no uh, false ideology or false God, what no uh, wisdom of men could achieve, God did. He wasn't too early. In the fever pitch of what was going on, God stepped into the scene to show that he is God. That he is God of gods. Who are these, the, these gods that make up the pantheon of Babylon? What do they do? What could they possibly bring to the table? Nor was God's provision too late. It wasn't too early. Things hit fever pitch so when, it, when he steps in, it's only what God could do. Nor is he too late, not just to save their tail, but so that the, the solution is not done away with. All the wise men in Babylon aren't killed off, so there's no other place to look. Now God steps in when an answer could be given to King Nebuchadnezzar. An answer that Nebuchadnezzar, probably as we'll see moving into chapter 3, not too fond of or excited about, but an answer that shows even the pagan king who's God. God's timing was perfect. Perfect. 
God's timing was also a tangible provision. What I mean by that is that God's provision in this circumstance was true to the problem that was at stake. It would be weird, as the book of James tells us in some ways, to see a brother who's cold, let's say on a day like today, you go outside and someone's walking around in a t-shirt and shorts and you say, man, I hope you stay warm. You give him a coat. God's provision in this instance was to meet the demand of the king, not because that was the king's demand, but because that's what God's plans and purposes entailed. It was timely. It was tangible. But I want to clarify just a couple of things to make, to make this abundantly clear for us today. It would be irresponsible of me to stand here right here and right now and teach you that God will always provide a way out of your big problems in life. That God's provisions will be timely and they will be tangible in the sense that he's going to bail you out of the circumstance that you're in. I will stand here and tell you that his, his provisions are timely. And I will stand here and tell you that they are tangible, but they are not always what we think they are. Because if we were to, for the sake of understanding, step into the shoes of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what they perceived their problem to be is we are dead. We must seek mercy from God so that we don't see the same destruction. But God was doing much more than they could perceive. God's purposes were not just to save Daniel and the three boys. That's not the end goal. The end goal is to show that he is God, that he has a bigger plan and a bigger purpose, that he alone is executing. And did they understand that at the time? Probably not. So sometimes the provisions that God may offer are not to bail you out and just to save you physically from whatever trouble you may find yourself in. Sometimes his provision may be simply to give you the strength, the courage, the wisdom to endure. The book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that there are individuals who have gone down in what we call the hall of faith who we're told this, that some of them were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. It says others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. It says they were stoned, sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. I will not say from this pulpit that God's provision in your life is going to be the sea, that he saves your hide. Because in this particular case, in Daniel, it worked within God's plans and according to his purposes that these men's lives would be spared because he had something else he was still doing. But those brothers and sisters in Hebrews chapter 11, did God fail in their case? No. In their testimony and in their story, God's still God. And God still accomplishes his purposes. He still acts according to his plans. So as we seek God to provide in the midst of whatever God-sized problems we may have, it's vitally important for us that we take a step back and seek out God's perspectives. Will we always know? No. Sometimes he calls us to simply walk by faith. God-sized problems deserve God-sized provisions. And sometimes the problem isn't what we think the problem is. They thought it was life and death. God had something else in the works. We need to see that, get that, because that's 
real life that we deal with today. We live in the moment God's dealing with something much bigger than we're part of. Are we willing to seek him and follow him in that? So God's size perspectives then. Daniel receives from the Lord the dream and its meaning. And he goes before King Nebuchadnezzar in, in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen in its interpretation? And here's where this is so clear that what we should caution ourselves against doing is saying that this is about Daniel and being faithful because what's Daniel's response? It's not me. It's not me, king. It's not my wisdom. It's not my intellect. This is from God and from God alone. This is a message from the Lord. So I'm not going to stand here and say, guys, this is about being like Daniel. I'm saying we are to to see what God is doing. And so Daniel goes on and he tells the king his dream. And the dream is uh, what we are told is of things that are to come. Okay, and this is, this is where Daniel can be interesting at times because we start seeing visions and dreams of things that are to come and we wrestle with what we're to do with it. And this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had is a dream that there was a great image, we are told. And this image was made up of different materials. Its head was of gold, uh, its body parts of silver and, and bronze and legs of iron, uh, feet partly of iron, partly of clay. As you look, we're told that a uh, stone cut out by no human hand struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and, and everything broke to pieces like chaff and blew away so there was no remains of it. And at surface, maybe you're like, this is the dream that kept Nebuchadnezzar up at night? It doesn't sound too threatening to me. But God's working. Here's what it means. Verse 37, and notice here something so unique. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and to whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. And it's interesting that as Daniel addresses King Nebuchadnezzar, he he uses verbiage here that at, at surface level almost seems like his verbiage is reserved only for God. But notice God had given it to him. The God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. As Daniel goes on and talks about the interpretation of this dream, what's it mean? He talks about kingdoms that are to come. The head of gold is Babylon, and then there's another kingdom that's going to come after you, and a kingdom after that, and a kingdom after that. And all these things are going to pass. And, and we could look at this in dream and say, okay, what, are, what do we do with this? Because in all honesty, we could, with some level of, of clarity and confidence, look at history and, and, and see which these kingdoms were. But Daniel doesn't speak to that, not here anyways. So what are we supposed to do with this? God in this moment is revealing to King Nebuchadnezzar a bigger picture. And this bigger picture involves two things. Number one, the reality that God raises up kingdoms and he brings them to ruin. Babylon was Babylon not because of King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was as Babylon was because God made it such. That's verse 37 and 38. Look at the Look at the extent of your dominion, the, 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 the amount of power and authority you have. Look at all those who dwell under uh, your leadership, O king. Guess what? All of it's been given to you by God. God raises up kingdoms, and the dream means this. He will also bring them to ruin. Because as great and magnificent and powerful and wonderful as Babylon was in its day, that wasn't the end of the story. Another kingdom will come. God would also tear that kingdom down. It's important for us even today to adopt this understanding. And not to, not to get it simply here. But to get it here. God raises up kingdoms. God brings them to ruin. Period. 
the affairs of man, the kingdoms of men, are all subject to the sovereignty of God. As he works out his plans, he accomplishes his purposes, there's an encouragement in there for us. That in our humility, we trust the sovereign hand of God. But there's also that humility to recognize and believe that he's the one who holds all things in his hands. Some people have questioned, just to be totally honest with you, the wisdom of our church right now to do a series like Daniel in an election year. That's bold stuff. I don't know. And we've responded to maybe it's the very best time we could do it. Because a year from now, today is January 21st, it means a year from today, there will be people that are lamenting what happens in November. There will be people who celebrate what happens in November, and there will be Christians on both sides of that aisle questioning, how, God, could you let this happen? Or thank you, Lord, for making it happen. In the timely application of Daniel's to remember that whatever happens, it didn't happen just because of a majority, uh, excuse me, a majority vote of the people. It happened because God appointed it. Do we believe these things in our hearts? To step back and adopt the God-sized perspectives that he has shown us throughout history time and time and time and time again that he is the one who raises kingdoms up and he brings them to ruin. Despite the power, despite the influence, despite the glory of those kingdoms, God's kingdom will last forever. And that's the point of this dream. It ends talking about this stone that's cut out not by human hands, that comes in and destroys these kingdoms. And this stone will, will, will form into a mountain that will fill all the earth. And there's one thing, despite whatever interpretations we have about Daniel, there's one thing that we know for certain. It's that stone is the kingdom of God brought to bear by the person of Jesus Christ. And however we're going to interpret all these things, we land at this knowing and believing that what God is declaring even then in history is that he reigns supreme. His kingdom will have no end. His kingdom will reach to the extents of the corners of the earth. That today as you and I sit in a small room, in a small building, in a small town, in a small place, we have brothers and sisters redeemed by the same Lord that are gathering and worshiping the same God all around the world now. God's kingdom is great. He reigns supreme as the king of kings. So at the end of the day, we can say with confidence, he is the Lord of kings. That's our God. Doesn't mean we won't live in Babylon, but we serve a king who's king over all. He rules over the affairs of mankind. So we're reminded, and I remind you this morning, that brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ, those of us in Christ are not merely citizens of Babylon. We're not merely citizens of the United States. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We have one king. And we worship and honor that one king. And for the here and now, he has called us to this place. And for these purposes, for his glory and his work, He's doing something more than we can probably wrap our heads around. So what are we to do with it? Well, I'll close with this. These God-sized issues demand God-sized praise. There are two responses to God in this episode. One by Nebuchadnezzar and one by Daniel. And we'll, we'll call these two responses a pragmatic response and a personal response. Notice Nebuchadnezzar in verse 47. If we closed the book at, at verse 47 and said, Truly your God is God of gods, Lord of kings, revealer of mysteries, for you've been able to reveal this mystery. We might be able to or be tempted to say, cue the end credits, close the book. What a great ending to the ad episode. Wow, we really wrapped up that plot pretty quickly. 
I thought this was going to shape out to be a bigger story. Turns out, here it is, said and done. But as we're going to see, God's not done with Nebuchadnezzar yet. Nor does Nebuchadnezzar get it yet. So his response to God, I think it's safer to say, is not a personal response and testimony of who God is to him, but a pragmatic response. Let's not forget the Babylonians were polytheists. They believed in many gods. They had the pantheon of gods. And this god, Daniel's god, just showed up and did what none of the other ones could. So from a purely secular standpoint, perhaps Nebuchadnezzar is saying, yeah, God of gods. Not the God, the one true God, nor does he even say, my God. Truly, Daniel, your God is the God of gods. Maybe the greatest of many. Maybe a mighty God, a wonderful God. But it's a response that in some ways to a king makes sense. Because in their day and age, when the kings would seek counsel from the divine, they sought it to see what was to come. Not so they could submit to it, but perhaps so they could do something about it. And in this instance, Nebuchadnezzar had received word from a God that his kingdom would come to an end. Word from a God that his greatness wasn't the top tier. And we're going to see as the story unfolds, starting in chapter 3, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to do something about it, or at least try. The second response is from Daniel. Daniel, we skipped over it in verses 20 through 23, where he blesses God. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings. He sets them up. And, and we notice that as Daniel praises God, he begins to speak of the attributes of God. In theology class, we're learning about who God is right now. What a timely thing to stop and to acknowledge his attributes. He, he affirms that God is an eternal God, that he is a wise and mighty God, that he is a God who holds dominion over times and seasons, over kings and kingdoms. He's a God who's generous to give wisdom, to give understanding. And then he goes on and he, he says, I, thank, I give thanks and praise for you've given me wisdom and might. You've made known to me what we've asked of you. And, and Daniel speaks of what God's done. And he speaks of his own affections for God. The difference, 23 to, 20 to 47, Nebuchadnezzar says, truly your God is God. Daniel says, to you, O oh God of my fathers. Can I just ask us an honest question? When it comes time to, to praising God, is your praise to God more pragmatic or more personal? A couple of weeks ago as we kicked off the new year, we talked about have you, have you tasted and seen that God is good? If you were to offer praise to God, is it something where you, you're going through the motions? You're singing the same songs because that's what we sing. You're saying the same stuff because that's what you were taught to say. Or do you know God? Can you speak to who he is? Because what we see through and through in the book of Daniel is that God is deserving of praise. God's like the grand chess master. For those of you who don't know how to play chess, that means he's the best of the best. He has a plan and he's executing his purposes with precision, with great wisdom and understanding. He is a God that is not thwarted. He is a God who is not taken off of his throne. But he rules over the kingdoms and the affairs of man sovereignly with his might and his power. So at the end of the day, as we look at Daniel chapter 2, as we're going to look at all of the book of Daniel, I'm just, I'm not convinced that Daniel chapter 2 is primarily about Daniel. I'm not convinced it's primarily about Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not convinced it's primarily about the guys. I think Daniel chapter 2 is there because it shows us something of who God is. God's revealing himself to the pagan people to show who he is. 
that he's not dead, he's not been defeated, and nor has he been taken off of his throne. But he is a God who sits on his throne. Day in and day out. He teaches that he is a faithful God, a God who is trustworthy and provides, a God who executes his plans and his purposes on his timetable. So I encourage you, as we read this book, there will be great encouragements and lessons to take from watching God's people live in Babylon. But if all we do is watch them, we're going to miss the bigger picture of what God is doing. Today, in episode two, we have the first of three encounters between God and Nebuchadnezzar, where God is going to challenge the thought, the premise, that the king is God in Babylon. God will prove himself to be God, and he will do it. And we pray this now.